Hello, dear FrostCon people. This is my talk on communications in distributed teams. My name is Florian. This is the second time that I'm speaking at FrostCon, and you probably want to know just what the hell qualifies me to talk about this specific subject. So why am I talking here? And more precisely, why am I talking here? I turned 40 last year. I've been in IT for uh, about 20 years now, of which 19 were full-time, and out of that I've worked in four successive companies, all of which at the time worked out of offices for a total of 11 years. I worked in a completely distributed company, which I founded for six years, and now for about three years I've been running a distributed team that's a business unit of a company that had previously existed for 15 years and throughout that time had only ever worked from a single office. So I think I might have seen and become aware of some of the rather interesting challenges that come with either of these configurations. And I originally wrote and presented this talk for the first time in December 2019, and at the time you probably had forgotten about uh, SARS, and you had no idea what SARS-CoV-2 was, or COVID-19, and many of you were probably working from offices. And then something like three months later, everything changed, and suddenly this talk became much more relevant, relevant to a much greater audience. Uh, and something else happened, which was that a lot of people suddenly started talking and writing about working from home and working in distributed teams. And a lot of these people, particularly those who were speaking most loudly, had themselves only been working in or managing distributed teams for, well, barely since March. And a fair uh, amount of what you could read about the subject then and can still read about that subject now is, quite frankly, complete and utter bullshit. Um, so... And I would like to rectify a few of these misconceptions. Um, and there's one thing, uh, one point that I actually didn't make in the initial version of uh, this talk at DevOps Days Tel Aviv in uh, last December, um, which uh, is because I thought at the time it was completely self-evident. So it, it was a point that it didn't need making. Um, but I've since changed my mind, and I do want to make this one thing very clear right from the outset. Um, effective distributed collaboration in a team is not pretending to be in an office while staring into a webcam all day. That's not how things work. You will never be able to capitalize on work as a distributed team unless you kick some office habits. And the key to distributed teams being effective is, interestingly, not that they're distributed, not that they're not all in the same place, as you'll see from the remainder of this talk. So to expect success from taking the habits of an office and then simply removing the element of locality and then replace every face-to-face -face meeting with a video call and otherwise carry on as if nothing happened is patently ludicrous. So just don't do that. The good news is, though, that if you do it right, if you do distributed teams right, you'll end up with a far better team than a far more productive team than a local one would ever be, where everyone has a chance of better work-life balance and you don't waste awful amount of time and energy and fossil fuels on your commute. So you'll find a few general themes throughout this talk. Uh, I'll talk about what modes we have available for communication in uh, distributed teams. I'm going to talk about why distributed teams always collaborate asynchronously and what communication modes lend themselves to that particularly well. I'll talk about why written communication is so important in distributed teams, in fact, much more important than spoken communications, and why meetings, like video calls, are a mode of communication that effective distributed teams hardly ever need to use, except for very specific reasons, which I'll get to. But I do want to state one thing up front. This is not science. So nothing of what I'm talking about is steeped in any degree of scientific rigor. I present anecdotes, not studies. I might be mistaking correlation for causation or the other way around. Everything that I'm talking about is solely based on my personal experience and the experience of others that I have worked with or talked to or watched or read. And everything that I say here, of course, is subject to debate and rebuttal, and you can simply have a different opinion, but it's definitely not science. Now, with all of that said, let me attempt to give you a definition of a distributed team, at least according to my own understanding. A distributed team is a professional group 
whose members do not rely on proximity in order to routinely collaborate productively. Now, I realize this is clearly not an ideal definition, at least because it defines something by a negative and also by an outside factor. It defines a distributed team by what it does not need in order to function. But it is the best definition I've been able to come up with, and I want to highlight a couple of key words in this definition. The first one is professional. I'm talking about teams that work towards a professional goal. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're all working at the same company. They could, for example, all work in different companies and collaborate on a joint project, something that frequently happens in open source projects. But the important thing is they're not pursuing their hobby, they're doing their job. And the second word that's important in this definition is routinely. I'm talking about teams that habitually and routinely and on an everyday basis work in a distributed fashion, which is quite distinct from the kind of work that goes on in an otherwise office-based team when one person is having a work-from-home day, if you're doing that sort of thing. And it's important to understand that the lack of proximity that I'm talking about is not only spatial, it's also temporal, because working in a distributed team means working asynchronously. So if your team is distributed, then that's equivalent to saying that it works in an asynchronous fashion, which is to say that people are going to work on things on their own time, in parallel, and a capable distributed team will have just as few synchronization points as are absolutely necessary. And the reason for that is not just that you might be working in different time zones, but also the fact that everyone is going to have their own daily routine, they're going to have their individual times when they're most productive, which you won't attempt to synchronize. If you're managing a distributed team and you're trying to synchronize people's daily schedule, that's setting up the entire team for failure. So just don't do that. Now this doesn't come for free and it doesn't fall in our lap because people are not born with the ability to work in a distributed team. It's not a skill that we, that drops in our lap. It is a skill that we need to learn. Humans for the past two million years or so have functioned best in groups that collaborated in close proximity to one another. And it's only quite recent that technology has started to enable us to override that, at least to a certain extent, which gives us other benefits like the ability to work from home or the ability to hire people who reside wherever they may be, just as long as they have internet connectivity, uh, that sort of thing. So now we can work in teams despite being potentially continental distances away from each other. But we do have to acquire the skills for that. And if we fail to do so, specifically if we fail to acquire the collaboration and communication skills for that, then that's a rather grave disadvantage, which is, of course, that absolutely nothing has as dire an impact on productivity as poor communications. Now, I realize that that's a bit of a truism, and it certainly applies to both distributed and non-distributed teams, because if you have bad communications, that's a surefire way to uh, wreck any project, blow any budget, fail any objective. And of course, it's also important to understand that the reverse is not true. (laughs) So having good communications does not guarantee success, but having bad communications absolutely does guarantee failure. And there is one thing to start with, specifically for distributed teams, which is that a capable distributed team habitually and routinely externalizes information. So information is generally far less useful when it's only stored in one person's head, as opposed to being accessible in a shared system that everyone trusts and can use. And if you take important information out of your own head, and store it in a medium that allows others to easily find and importantly contextualize it, put it in the correct context, put it in relation to other bits and pieces of information. If you can do that, then that's a win for everyone. And since we're all technology people, we try to sort of, or we usually try to approach this from a perspective of tools or a standpoint of tools, and we typically have multiple tools, multiple facilities to externalize and share and then access information Um, at our disposal. So let's see how those compare. Let's talk about modes of communication in distributed teams. A distributed team will routinely use multiple modes of communication on a daily basis, and it will rely mostly on those that make sharing and finding and contextualizing information easy, and it will avoid those that make it difficult. And uh, I want to say one thing, which is that in many teams, whether they're distributed or not, and for a rather long time now, at least for a period of several years, 
using chat as a text chat as a default mode of communications is becoming the norm and I want to posit that with one important exception which I'm going to get to at the end of the talk this is not a symptom of having a particularly dynamic or efficient team um, I posit it's the opposite it's a symptom for the uh, uh, particularly bad kind of laziness and I want to emphasize it's laziness not malice it's I don't want to insinuate that people are doing this with bad intentions but um, using chat for everything is an attempt to communicate quickly and easily for yourself and at the same time you're really making things harder for everyone including yourself because while sharing information in a chat is extremely easy. It's also a fire and forget mode of communications. Chat makes it very difficult to find information or retrieve information after the fact. So you'll certainly relate to this if you've ever attempted to scour a busy Slack or ISC archive for a discussion on a specific topic that you vaguely remember and that you only remember to have happened a few weeks ago it's almost impossible to find that sort of thing unless you actually have like specific key phrases that you can search for and that's not a great thing um, and it's even more difficult to read say for example a slack discussion um, in context which is to say in relation to other discussions that may have happened on the same topic either in the same channel or in a different channel and perhaps you know days or weeks earlier later that sort of thing is really really difficult um, so chat is really a bad mode of communications when it comes to contextualizing information. So let's compare that to other communication modes that we do have available um, at our disposal. For example, email. Um, email makes it very easy to share information with a person or group from the get-go if you loop them into a discussion straight away but it's quite difficult to loop the same people into an ongoing discussion after the fact so after it has started um, so in a way it's even worse than chat here um, finding information is just as hard as with chat so that's also quite difficult um, but it is admittedly marginally better at contextualizing information uh, than chat because you do get proper threading so you know like i said marginally better but what are other modes that we also typically do have available at our disposal and make it easier to actually find and importantly contextualize information so for example a wiki and an issue tracker provided that you don't lock them down with like silly permissions they make it really very easy to share and find and contextualize information. Um, and I do want to point out here that if I'm talking about a wiki, that's shorthand for any facility that allows you to collaboratively edit long form documents online, which can be an actual wiki like a media wiki, but it could also be uh, Google Docs or Confluence or anything like that. And likewise, an issue tracker can mean um, RT or OTRS, Jira, Tiger, Bugzilla, whatever you're using, whatever works for you. So uh, what these all allow us to do is make it very easy to link bits and pieces of information uh, together by adding cross-references and that sort of thing, and really makes it very easy to contextualize information while making sharing the information just as easy as, for example, in chat, and provided you have a good search facility, also makes it very easy to find things. So generally, those are two things a wiki and an issue tracker are really two means of communications that you want to use because they're actually very helpful. Video calls, however, video calls are worse than all of the others. Video calls are worse than chat and email because sharing information, well, it works, but it doesn't scale because you can't reasonably have more than five or so people in a video call and sharing the recording of a video call is just completely pointless. So really what you want to do is you want to make your wiki and your issue tracker your default mode of communications and use all the others quite sparingly, uh, which I do want to point out is not meant to be a euphemism for don't use them. I'll get to that in just a moment, but you want to use them. You want to use all the others very sparingly and you want to use, well, video calls for just very specific reasons. Let's talk about chat a little bit more. Um, and these days, of course, this frequently means Slack, but what I'm talking about could also apply, or does also apply to ISC, Matamos, Riot, anything like that. 
is a text chat universally useful? I think I've already established that it isn't. But is it universally bad? No, not either. There is a very specific type of situation in which text chat is absolutely a good thing. Using interactive chat is a really good idea for the kind of communication that requires immediate and interactive mutual feedback from two or more participants. Um, so and what that means is that the only thing that chat is good for is communication that is required to be synchronous for whatever reason. And remember, in a distributed team, asynchronicity is the norm. So if using interactive chat for communications, you can totally do that, but you want it to be an exceptional event in a distributed team. And if it's a completely regular and the default mode of communications, it's likely that you're just going to make everyone on the team miserable. And for any interaction that uh, does not require feedback that is both immediate and interactive, uh, email, a wiki, or an issue tracker are all quite far superior modes of communications. Now, using direct messages or DMs in chat, um, in order to be able to use that, there, or in order for those to be useful, let's put it that way, there is this very clearly delineated confluence of events that have to occur, which is you want immediate feedback or you need immediate feedback from the other person, you need mutual back and forth with the other person, and you don't want others to follow the conversation. Now, I can't emphasize enough that that's a combination that's certainly perfectly valid, but it is exceedingly rare. Because if you want just a private exchange of ideas with someone and not need immediate mutual feedback, encrypted email will do just fine. Uh, if you want to work on something together with one person before you share it with others, you can use restricted permissions on a wiki page or an issue tracker ticket, and then you open them up as soon as you're ready to share. Um, and that's better than using chat DMs as well. Um, and if you don't need confide confidentiality, but you do need interactive and immediate feedback, then chances are that sooner or later you're going to want to loop other people into the discussion, um, or at least that's far more likely than that you won't. So, you know, just you don't use DMs, just use a shared channel from the get-go, because that way it's way easier for others to follow the conversation if needed, um, and in the process, if you loop them in from the start, they might be able to point out, um, say, an incorrect assumption that one of you has before you end up, you know, going after a red herring. Pinging someone in a chat, which is mentioning their username, and that usually triggers some form of a visual or auditory notification. That's exactly like walking up to a person, interrupting what they're doing, and then tapping them on the shoulder and asking them a question. A chat ping is exactly the same thing. And no matter whether it's your intention or not, that person is going to feel compelled to answer relatively promptly. And so that means that you're potentially breaking their train of thought, yank them out of a complex task, force them to redo whatever it was that they did pre-interruption, or actually commit a mistake or break things. So pinging someone in a chat is something that you should do only if you're aware of exactly this risk and you have judged and are convinced that whatever you're pinging about is more important. Um, because otherwise, if you're doing this routinely, if you're just routinely pinging people all the time for things that are not urgent or where you don't considering this interruption, it's likely that you're just going to be seen as a jerk and you don't want to do that. A naked ping is the action of sending someone a message that consists only of their username and a marker like ping or hi or hey or similar and no other context or information. Any person who is well versed in the use of chat communications will, when you subject them to this kind of behavior, be inclined to flay you alive. Just don't do that. Just don't send naked pings. When you ping someone, always add context. Always, always, always. Like in this example, it makes a world of a difference to ping the person saying, hey, can I get your eyes on PR so-and-so, than to just say, hey, which is absolutely useless. Uh, don't, also, don't say, can I ask you your question? Instead, just ask the question. The person is going to get to it whenever their time allows. 
Um, and you can also do something like if you do want to ping something and you simultaneously want to emphasize that this is not, uh, what you're talking about is not extremely urgent, then you can ping them with, say, for example, can I get your eyes on PR so-and-so, no particular urgency, you know, do it at your convenience. Although even then, you know, it's probably better to just send them an email. Um, I hope it is self-evident why naked pings are a bad thing and providing context is a much better idea. But if it's not, then please read uh, the article entitled Naked Pings on the GNOME blog, uh, courtesy of Adam Jackson and Mark McLaughlin. It's rel relatively easy to find and has a good summary of why naked pings are a bad idea and why you shouldn't be using them. With that said about chat, let's actually talk about video calls. And it doesn't matter, again, what technology it is that we're talking about. It could be Zoom, it could be Google Hangouts, it could be BlueJeans, Jitsi, whatever. Um, and I'd like to address this bit in a little more detail, uh, given the fact that in the current pandemic, the use of video calls appears to have uh, skyrocketed. The only reason to use video calls is to be able to pick up on non-textual and non-verbal cues. I want to be clear that that's a very good reason, but it's really the only reason to use calls. Video calls have a very significant drawback, which is that until we get reliable automatic you know, speech recognition and capturing and transcription, they're only half on the record uh, because hardly anyone goes to the trouble of preparing a full transcript of a meeting. And if anything, we get perhaps a summary of points that were discussed and the items that were agreed to. Um, but so even if we keep recordings of every video call that we attend, no one watches those. And it's practically impossible to discern um, after the fact uh, what was discussed in the meeting, including what was discussed before any decisions were made. And it's also, as with as the example that I gave previously with scouring a chat archive, with video calls, that's even worse. It's practically impossible to find a discussion point that you only have a vague recollection of, um, you know, which call it was discussed in and when it was discussed. And, you know, going through potentially hours and hours of video recording is just absolutely dreadful. Whereas if, we, if you're having the discussion from the get-go in an archived uh, or version text-based medium, like for example a wiki page, it's much easier to get that information. And of course, every video call needs an agenda, and that's true for any meeting, not just those conducted by video call, but a conversation without an agenda is useless. Uh, you do want people to know what to expect of the call. You also want people, you also want to give people the option to prepare for the call, um, such as doing some research or pulling together some documentation. And if you fail to circulate this information ahead of time, I can essentially pretty much guarantee you that the call is going to be ineffective and likely going to result in a repeat performance. So just have a video, have an agenda for every video call and don't have video calls without an agenda. The same thing is true. The same thing that I said about an agenda is also true about meeting notes. So again, until machines get intelligent enough to do this for us, that is to say automatically describe and summarize what was spoken in a meeting, you want to write notes and a summary of every meeting that you attend and circulate them. And uh, importantly, to circulate them to everyone who has a need to know. Um, and I do want to point out that effective distributed teams generally understand that it's the record of a call that's what counts. It's not the call itself. It's not the spoken word that matters. It's the written one. And from that, of course, follows this con consequence, which is that, you know, in order to be useful, uh, preparing a proper write-up of a call takes more time and effort than the call itself. If you think that video calls are any less work than chat meetings or a shared document that's being edited together and then discussed in comments, think again, right? The only way that a video call is ever less work is when everyone's lazy and the call is therefore useless. Uh, so every meeting needs notes and a summary, and you need to circulate these notes not only with everyone who attended the meeting, but with everyone who has a need to know. And uh, here's a bit of structure that I usually use for these meeting notes. Uh, all of my meeting notes essentially 
if you follow the same structure, they look pretty much the same. There's a meeting title at the top. Uh, there's a summary of when the meeting was and who attended, so date, time, and our attendees. Then an executive summary, the discussion points of the meeting in a table, and then finally the action items, the takeaways uh, from that meeting. And there's a reason that I put the executive summary at the very top, because that makes it very helpful for people uh, reading the meeting notes to skim over the summary and then they can decide whether either they should familiarize themselves immediately with what was discussed and then possibly respond if they have objections or input. Um, that's one option. Option two is maybe they only want to be aware of what was decided. Um, or three, maybe they want to just keep in the back of their head that a meeting happened and that notes exist and where they can find them. Um, if they need to refer back to them. And the funny thing is, of course, that once you adhere to this standard, and I repeat, that's the only acceptable standard for video meetings in a distributed team, um, you'll quickly notice that frequently you can actually skip the meeting altogether and just use a collaboratively edited document instead of your agenda and your meeting notes and everything else. And uh, once you've removed the meeting, you've removed an unnecessary synchronization point, and that's always a good thing, it's always a win in, um, in, in an environment like that, in a distributed environment like that. There is one thing that I do believe video calls are actually good for, and that is to use them for recurring meetings as an opportunity to sort of feel the pulse of your team. And obviously a distributed team has few recurring meetings because those are synchronization points and we've already discussed that we strive to minimize synchronization points. So um, the idea of like having daily stand-ups or daily check-ins is out the window. Likewise, you know, sprint planning meetings and sprint retrospectives all the time, that's also fundamentally incompatible with distributed teams. Um, this, by the way, in my humble opinion, means that Scrum is a terrible idea in distributed teams, but I generally believe that, that Scrum is a terrible idea, period. And I happen to have talked about that at this very conference. Um, so forget the idea of having daily check-ins or daily stand-ups, anything like that, but having perhaps one meeting a week, or maybe one every two weeks, is in a video call, that is useful precisely for the aforementioned reasons of, uh, reasons of, of being able to pick up on uh, non-verbal cues, like uh, body language, posture, facial expression, tone, because if people are unhappy, uh, that'll show. If they're relaxed and productive, uh, that's gonna show too. Uh, so that's a good sort of uh, side benefit of these video calls. Uh, or maybe you could argue it's the most important benefit if you're that kind of person. Um, but you do want to make sure that, of course, these meetings do follow the same rules about agenda notes. Um, and um, also, at least it's, that's true for my team, these meetings are not strictly necessary to get the work done. So the team that I run has have to have like one one hour meeting a week um, but whenever a meeting conflicts with something like travel or a conference or something like that um, then we can skip it and we can divide up our work just via the circulate coordination notes and we've done that before and it also works and the video call is really just for that for the purpose of that um, emotional connection that we want to have uh, on the team and for that it's it's actually very useful I want to talk about um, something that has to do with the situation of embarking on a new thing. You're starting a new project, you're adopting a new technology or something like that. And whenever something like that happens, I think it's a good idea to thoroughly brief people. And again, yes, this is something that you can do in a meeting, uh, but you can also do it via email or in a wiki document or something like that. But the important thing is that you write these things down. And I want to suggest that when you write these things down, when you write these briefing notes, as I call them, um, you should be considering, or you could be considering, um, a five paragraph uh, format. Now, this is a five paragraph format that actually comes out of the military. It's used by many armed forces in NATO parlance. This is called the five paragraph field order. And I want to emphasize, I'm not generally a fan of applying military thinking to civilian life because, you know, we 
should be aware of the fact that the military is an institution or an organization optimized for killing people and breaking things. Um, but in this case, it is something that I think can actually be very much applied to professional communications in business with some rather minor modifications. So this is the original. Um, in, in, the, in the military, these five paragraphs that we're talking about are called the situation, the mission, the execution, the logistics, and then finally command and signal, which is just military speak for communications. And in business or for work, um, I use a slightly modified format uh, or slightly modified headings here. I call them um, situation, objective, plan, logistics, and communications. Um, situation is about the position that we're in, uh, why it is that we set out to do what we want to do. You can break this down into subcategories, like talking about the customer situation, your own company situation, and then maybe you know the situation of the market in general or something like that. But the first thing is, okay, you lay out more or less uh, the, the backdrop or the stage here for what it is that we want to do. Uh, the second item is our objective, the thing that we want to achieve. Plan is how we want to achieve it, or at least as much as we know about that at this stage. Logistics um, is about what budget and resources are available and how we're going to use them. And finally, communications is about how you're going to be coordinating, coordinating amongst ourselves and with others uh, in order to achieve our goal, in order to achieve our objective. And like I said, you know, this can be an email, it could be a long, um, a long wiki page or something like that, but the, the, form, the format really doesn't, or the medium doesn't really matter. What matters is the content that these five items are in there. And generally speaking, if you write things up, thinking about these five items and putting them in this order, it's quite likely that you're including well, practically everything that people immediately need to know about what you're telling them about. Whenever you're briefing people, people will always have questions. They might not just not think of them straight away. So you, something that you don't really want to do is uh, just say, are there any questions? Because the knee-jerk response to that is frequently no. Uh, but what you want to do instead is you want to have a follow-up round at a later time. It can be two hours later, it can be the next day, it can be the next week. And in that, you want to encourage your team to actually come back with questions. And of course, then what you can also do is you can use the same follow-up for checking how your own briefing came across by gently quizzing people on individual items, like by what date do we want to implement feature X? Or, you know, Jane, what, do you, what are you going to need to coordinate with Joe on? That sort of thing. And of course, that also gives you valuable feedback on the quality of your own briefing, because if your team can't answer these questions, then chances are that your briefing wasn't as clear, you weren't as clear as you should have been, and then you can uh, improve on that next time around. Finally, or next rather, um, because I do have a few other things. Uh, Next, I want to say a few words about what I'd like to call Uh, what I like to call uh, pinching the fire hose that you might otherwise be forced to drink from. Um, Because um, when you work in a distributed team, because everyone's on their own schedule, everything is asynchronous, you're basically dealing with a constant incoming stream of information. Um, And that information comes from your colleagues, from your reports, from your manager, from your customers, and there's really no way to change this, right? Um, That's just a fact of life in a distributed team. So what you do need to do is you want to apply your own structure to that stream, because otherwise you're going to be unhappy very, very quickly. And what follows, what I'm talking about uh, next, is not the way to do it, but one way to do it. And you might find that another way works better for you but you're going to need to define and apply some structure because otherwise you're going to feel constantly overwhelmed or quickly feel overwhelmed and you run a high risk of burnout. And the approach that I'm talking about um, is called the 4D approach and I learned about this uh, from reading David Allen's Getting Things Done. I don't actually know whether David Allen invented this approach or whether someone else came up uh, with that before him, but it's just how I know about it. Uh, So the 4D approach uh, from getting things done um, is uh, means that applying to any incoming bit of information, um, you do like one of four things with them. And uh, every one of them happens to start with the letter D. So that's why it's 4D. 
Um, and the first thing, uh, the first option or the first possibility that may have that you may have to do with a with a uh, with a bit of information is to just read it, understand it, and then archive it. But you know, n there's no action on your part that it's required. And um, David Allen calls this dropping this bit of information. So that's one possible action is just drop, read, understand, archive, and it's what you use for anything that doesn't require any action on your part. Delegate is the next one. Uh, delegate are things that do require action, but not from you. So you want to make sure that it gets to the right person as understood by that person, and then you make a note for follow-up. Defer means it's something that needs doing, and it's you who needs to do it, but it doesn't need doing immediately. So you enter it into your task list, to use a very generic term, um, and clear it from your inbox and come back to it later. And finally, do are the tasks that remain, and those are typically very few, that need to be done, and they need to be done by you, and they need to be done immediately. And if you sort your incoming bits of information uh, like that, then um, that doesn't mean that you'll never be overwhelmed by the amount of information that you're dealing with and that you need to process, but it'll greatly reduce that risk and make things much more manageable. For dropping, there's a few rules for dropping things. It doesn't mean that you ignore them. You still have to read and understand what's in that incoming bit of information, um, and you want to be able to find that information later. So you never delete things, um, except spam. Um, you archive them instead in a way that keeps them retrievable in the future. And of course, if there's something that isn't understandable to you at this point, you want to think it through and look for clarification. Delegation obviously requires that you have a person that you can delegate to. And it's important to understand that that's not necessarily someone who reports to you. Instead, it might be someone you report to, because uh, you might be asked to deal with something that you have no control over, but your manager does. So what you want to do for delegation is you want to find the right person that can get the task done or that can deal with that bit of information. You then want to preemptively send them all the information that you think they might need and that you have access to rather than waiting for them to ask, right? Just say, hey, you know, this needs doing and this is all the information that I think you might need to do that. Here are all the links that you might need. Here's, here are the documents that, you need, that you're going to need to find and so on. You want to, and this is, I think, a very important one that's often overlooked, you want to ask them to acknowledge uh, that they have received your message and that they have have got all the information that they need um, can be very simple you know just a, a in an email for example can just be a line please acknowledge and let me know if you need anything else um, because that removes this whole idea of you know having to follow up two days later in order to make sure that they've actually read what they got and so on you know just ask them to acknowledge and then establish that as a habit uh, that people always acknowledge the incoming information that they get. And then, of course, you want to make a note uh, to follow up and to see if they... To follow up, number one, to see if they need anything else, if necessary, um, because things might have developed and whatnot. And then you want to follow through by seeing the task to completion. And then, of course, I should mention, this should go without saying, but it doesn't hurt to mention it, that whenever we're whenever you're delegating within your own team, when you're delegating to someone who reports to you, uh, the only thing that you ever delegate is the task and not the responsibility. You know, you can get someone else to do something uh, who reports to you, but it's still your responsibility to ensure that it gets done. You don't delegate the responsibility, you, don't, you just delegate the task. And I think you shouldn't delegate, or for that matter, even define any tasks that you're not prepared to follow through on. Right. So as an example, if you just hand wave, you know, let's everyone, everyone use encrypted email from now on and you're not even prepared to make that work for your own email account, you might as well just leave it. You might as well, you know, never make that announcement. Um, if you do proclaim a specific objective or a rule and then you find yourself unable to follow through on it, which happens, and I maintain it's not a sign of ineptitude or failure or anything like that, uh, but when it happens, you just want to loudly and clearly rescind it. And I think it's far better, it's always far better to always visibly backtrack than to be received as someone whose pronouncements are safe to ignore. But if you do delegate, if you do give someone a task, um, you absolutely want to be prepared to 
follow up and actually do follow up on things. Deferring simply means that because there is something that needs, needs doing um, and you need to do it, but it doesn't need doing immediately, you can do it at a time of your convenience. You can do it at a time that suits your schedule. And that means, of course, for that to work, you want to uh, add the task immediately to some sort of task queue, whatever that is. For email, for example, it can be just a, a folder that's called needs reply. It can be like <laughs> super low tech about this. So, but you want to set it aside. You want to make sure that you go through this queue at a later time to prioritize, um, ideally right after you're done with the do tasks, which, which I'll get to in a second. And uh, then, of course, you absolutely want to ensure that you make time to go back and actually do these prioritized tasks at a time that is convenient for you. And finally, there'll be your do tasks, so stuff that you need to do and that you uh, need to do immediately. And when you get to those, um, here are my suggestions for them. You want to tell people that you're doing them because you'll want to be uninterrupted. Uh, you can like update your presence status in your chat or you know, put some block time in your calendar, uh, something like that. You want to make sure that you're uninterrupted, turn off your notifications, you know, just have time to concentrate. And then finally, plow through all of the undropped and undelegated and undeferred items in your inbox until it's empty. Um, and then you can come back to working on your tasks on your own time. And the entirety of this talk up to this point has focused on professional communications, right? Um, like talking about work or coordinating around work and so on. And among people who are unfamiliar or inexperienced with work in a distributed team, um, they will often accept that distributed te teams can communicate well professionally, but then they frequently ask, okay, what about the water cooler talks or, 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 or you know, coffee talks. What about all these informal discussions that happen at work while people are getting water or coffee or sit together over lunch? Because there's always so much communication that's happening at work that's informal, but it's indispensable also and it's extremely beneficial to everyone. It's extremely beneficial to the company. And uh, while I acknowledge that kind of thinking, I do want to point out that many companies where information exchange hinges on coffee or cafeteria talk are simply those organizations that don't give a damn about externalizing information, <laughs> right? Because of course, if 90% of your company's knowledge is only in people's heads, then you're dead without the lunchroom, you're dead without the cafeteria talk. But if the same thing were to happen in a distributed team, that team never gets off the ground. Right. So if you have a team that's functional and productive because it routinely externalizes information, then the absence of chit chat over coffee has a very low or perhaps zero negative impact on the information flow. However, you might also be talking or interested in the in the completely non work related talk that happens over coffee. Right, So the kind of stuff that simply contributes to people's relaxation and well-being and emotional connectedness and empathy and so on. And um, I want to say this, this one thing, right? Um, there are plenty of people who can make a distributed contribution to your company, but who dislike the social aspect of work. That's something that you should totally recognize and accept. Uh, you might have people, you might be working with people who thrive when being left alone uh, with as little small talk as possible because they want to have their social interactions with friends and family and not with colleagues at work. Uh, and that's fine. That's something that you should, that you should respect. But if you, even if you do have people on your team or you are such a person yourself who enjoys having an entirely informal conversation every once in a while, there totally is room for that in a distributed team as well. Because the only thing that you need to do is you need to agree on a signal, which means that I'm taking a break and I'll be happy to chat with anyone who's inclined preferably about non-work related things uh, or whatever the meeting is that your group agrees on. It could be as simple as a keyword in chat, uh, like coffee break, right? Um, so, uh, you know, whenever someone drops coffee break into a channel, it means, you know, I'm getting a coffee or whatever, you know, your, your preferred beverage is, um, and you're flicking on your, your camera or, you know, just your audio, and you're happy to talk with anyone who wants to join you 
and um, and those discussions need to be work related, right? It's perfectly doable. You can absolutely do that. It only requires agreeing on a code code word, basically, something like that. Okay, I do want to mention one other thing for balance, uh, which is that there is a complete alternative framework for distributed teams working together uh, than what I've been talking about, and that is what people uh, refer to as chat ops. Chat ops has been around for a while, to the best of my knowledge. First company to run chat ops on a larger scale and, and also talk about it publicly was GitHub. There's a 2013 talk by uh, Jesse Newland at Ruby Fuser where he talks about the concept and so on. And if a distributed team operates on a chat ops basis, it's the interactive text chat where everything, absolutely everything happens. Um, so everyone lives in chat all the time and all issues, alerts, events are piped into the chat. Everything is discussed in the chat and importantly, everything is also resolved in the chat. And such a system relies heavily uh, on the use of chatbots. So for example, you'd have an alert that lands in the channel and then you have a discussion that yields that the proper fix to the problem is to say run a specific Ansible playbook. And then you send an in-chat bot command that kicks off a playbook, uh, that playbook run, and then reports the result. And that of course is you know, that approach is quite laudable because it resolves this major issue that you're typically having with using chat, which is the classic scenario of um, a problem popping up, it being discussed in the chat, and then someone goes away for a bit and comes back and says, I fixed it, and everyone's happy and moves on, and nobody else actually understands what the problem was. And if you make everything explicit and in-band, such as actually fixing the problem in chat via a bot command, then all of that is um, out in the open. Everyone understands how to fix a problem. And in principle, it's always possible to go back to a previously solved problem when it reappears. And then you replay the solution uh, by you know, running the same chat commands and, and so on. So uh, I don't want to discount that and dismiss it at all. Uh, but, uh, and I don't want to uh, uh, de-emphasize that this can totally make sense. I think it absolutely can make sense. But the question is, under what circumstances? Um, and I maintain that chat ops is best suited for when your work inherently tends to be linear with respect to some outside dimension. If you have something that, uh, some degree of linearity that um, puts the entire team on one track. Um, and so, for example, if your primary job is to keep a system operational versus the linear passage of time, uh, chat hops, I think, is a very workable approach. But keeping complex operation uh, operational over time is the definition of, you guessed it, ops, right? So a uh, chat ops may be a very uh, suitable communication mode for operations, but I'd maintain it's rather unlikely to be efficient as a generic mode of communication across distributed teams, not all of which have anything to do with operations. Uh, and even then, uh, I, I posit it's difficult to get right because you have to curve channel sprawl and, and solve threading and other things, but that's a whole different talk. Um, and indeed, it's a talk for a whole different speaker because I'm not a chat ops expert and I don't even lead an ops team. So to summarize, uh, here's my key points from this talk in a nutshell. Please make these your key takeaways. Distributed teams are better than localized teams, but not because they're distributed, but because they're inherently asynchronous, and that is a far su superior method of collaboration. So therefore, if you're running a distributed team or you're working in a distributed team, you want to avoid anything that makes that distributed team run synchronously. And that in turn means you use less chat, you have fewer meetings, and you write things down. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your talk, Florian. And now, um, please come in the big blue button where you can ask questions per microphone or per chat. Uh, okay, so I'll start uh, quickly with the uh, user bit in here. So uh, thanks. Apparently your question was, was answered. Uh, so that's good. Uh, I'll skip it then. Um, and then uh, we have a question from uh, Marius. And the question is, uh, I wonder what makers of chat software are thinking 
when offering one kind of notification type sound or visualization. No differentiation between different tags or whether the mes message happens somewhere in a channel or is directed at me directly, etc. Have you found that some tools do better than others in this regard? Uh, the short answer is no, I have not. And in fact, I find uh, notifications, it, literally any kind of Good. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I just got royally confused because I still had the uh, other window open that had the uh, stream uh, that was uh, about, I don't know, something like 20 seconds delayed. And so I hurt myself with 20 seconds delay, which is horribly confusing. So I closed it now. Um, so apologies for that. Okay. Anyway, so the question was, uh, are there any tools that do better than others in with regards to notifications and, and whatnot? Um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask this because I routinely turn off notifications in just about everything that I use uh, because uh, I find that for my personal workflow, it is absolutely terrible to get this uh, sort of constant stream of interruptions. And I much prefer uh, doing my own context switches. So what I typically do is I actually leave all uh, notifications off. Um, and uh, I make a conscious effort to say, for example, um, you know, check email every hour or, or check a chat channel if I use one um, on a regular basis or something like that. Um, and so uh, I simply wouldn't know whether there are some tools that are better than others when it comes to doing notifications because I literally don't use them. I'm like not in the target demographic for those. Some more questions. Is it, it is possible to um, switch on the microphone if you like. Uh, so we have a question from Marcus here. What about team members who are not very tech savvy or functionally illiterate? Um, okay, so on the one hand, I think that's, um, you know, considering people to like be not tech savvy or functionally literate is almost patronizing and condescending. Um, with that said, though, I do, I am talking about um, like uh, people in a in an information technology team. Uh, but then again, you know, I think that so say, for example, the use of a wiki or, or, or Google Docs or anything like that, a, a collaboratively edited editable, you know, document management framework um, is really not something that is beyond the reach of just about anyone. Um, so yeah, um, I, I think, uh, of course, you will want to uh, adapt to, you know, what the technical um, um, abilities of your, of your team are. Uh, but ultimately, it boils down that, you know, if a, if a tool, if any facility does not have the, a user experience that makes it useful with a moderate amount of documentation that people can read, then that's probably a tool that you don't want to use in the first place. So that answers the questions. Thanks, Marcus. There are still five minutes over to ask questions, if you like. Right, so while, you, while you're still thinking about questions, um, I do want to uh, uh, point out a few things that I made in the chat uh, throughout the talk, um, which is my what slides uh, and all my speaker notes are available. They're also up on FRAB, so you can uh, get them from the FrostCon uh, program page. Um, there is also a little Twitter thread about this talk, which I'll put some additional information into. And uh, if you would like to uh, get in touch about anything in that thread, then please feel free to reply to that. And that thread is also mirrored on Mastodon, where I have the same handle, uh, mastodon.social, where I have the same handle as I do here in the chat and I do on Twitter. Okay, so there will coming no questions now. So thank you very much again, Florian, for your lovely talk in the nature. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the participation.
um, yeah, have a nice day, and maybe we will see you in the next talk. Right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Cheers. Bye.